One, two, three. They say in the distant past, everyone who lived here was a wanderer. And though over long, long years our roots grew deep, the wanderers were always among us, with voices waiting to be heard. If only we knew how to listen. On a rock of the shore is the cormorant's dwelling. The wild warbling blackbird has its nest in the tree. The birds of the air and the fish of the ocean Each has its own place But there's no place for me I'm Damien Labar. I come from a long line of gypsy travellers, and I'm an author and poet. Stories are my living. Most people in Britain had never heard the stories of gypsies and travellers from their own mouths. I want to tell you how all that started to change. In 1964, the broadcaster Charles Parker and the folk musicians Ewan McColl and Peggy Seeger travelled the length and breadth of Britain gathering the words of travellers, then a despised and outcast people, weaving their words with songs and music that told of their situation, speaking straight to the soul of the listener. Born in the middle of the afternoon In a horse-drawn wagon on the old A5 the big 12 wheeler shook me bad You can't stop here, the policeman said You'd better get born in some place else So move along, get along, move along, get along, go Move! The travelling people captured the heart of gypsy life as it was over 50 years ago. So what has changed? I want to find out. By journeying all over Britain, I want to meet the travelling people now, to hear about their lives, about what matters to them, with the aim of creating a new ballad, a ballad for the travellers of today. Billy Welch lives in Darlington, in the northeast of England, an area with centuries of Romany Gypsy history. Billy is a very important leader of our community. He's the main man of Appleby Fair. And I want to talk to Billy about some of the main themes of the original ballad of the travelling people, which are still important now. The horse fairs, the deep roots of our people in certain areas, the stories of where we come from, and also this idea that as we were at a crossroads then, perhaps we're at another one now, and I want to hear what Billy's got to say about the big issues facing us in the future. When we arrived in this country, round about 1450, people thought we were Egyptian so and, and and people in Western Europe thought we were Egyptian as well so we got called the people from Little Egypt and Gypsy for short and over 500 years we've become used to that and the English language being what it is that word got exported all over the world as well and we've become known as Gypsies all over the world. Gypsies began arriving in this country about 500 years ago and they're still arriving today. We've been actually in Darlington for 200 years Checks out great great grandfather wrote out. I mean, we've got written evidence of being over 200 years, but yet there's still that misconception that we've just arrived and we're society's dropouts. But we're not. We go much deeper than that. We have a very ancient culture, very ancient language, very ancient traditions. We didn't always move from country to country because of persecution. Sometimes we were economic migrants. We're better organised these days, and our technologies had a, played a big part in that the internet and Facebook and mobile phones and things, and where we would not see each other or hear from each other 
except for every Appleby or certain fairs. Now we're constantly in touch and we can organise ourselves better. As the main organiser of Appleby Fair, one of the biggest gypsy gatherings in Europe and scene of the famous Flashing Lane, where gypsies come from all over the aisles to ride and sell their horses, Billy commands a unique respect amongst Britain's travelling people. Back then it wasn't just a horse fair, it was horses, cattle, sheep, poultry, it was all kinds of things. And each farm would have 30, 40 farm hands on each farm in them days, they had no machinery things, and there was lots of farm, a big rural farm and area. They all got the wages on fair day of Appleby Fair. So all the farm hands would come down into the town and they would all have money in the pockets, a full year's wages in the pockets. Well, the gypsies found out about this, didn't they? And the gypsies went there, telling fortunes and selling them stuff. And they turned it into a horse fair. And it got such a gypsy horse fair that King James II, in 1685, chartered it as a gypsy horse fair. And that's how it became about. We've stopped off at Appleby because this is a place of pilgrimage for gypsies and travellers. And my family have been coming here for many decades, all the way from the south coast of England right up to Cumbria. It's quite weird to see it with nothing going on here like this because whenever I've been here in the past, it's been absolutely heaving with people and horses everywhere. Gypsies and travellers from all over the British Isles, visitors that come to see the fair and the spectacle of the horses, the old wagons. You can hear the clip and clop of the horses hooves echoing under these bridges down here. I can hear the men shouting and dealing, the women talking about what they're gonna buy. There's a big market on the hill. Traditionally, there used to be bow top wagons with the green canvas tops pulled up all along there, and you could see them with the burgundy and gold gilding glittering in the sun. This field would be full of people's trucks and cars, and up there, people would be camping with the vans and with the trailers and wagons and that. I'm going to touch the stone again, because I don't know whether I'll be back this year, but I hope I will be. Changing times fresh connections, an ancient people moving into a new era. Something else that I want to talk about with the next person we're going to see, Jess Smith, is this theme of powerful women that other people have been talking about. Jess obviously being a very powerful and empowered traveling woman and a, a published professional author, best-selling author, I want to get her thoughts on that but also these other themes. I want to talk to Jess about what Billy said, about the historical, but also the tales that we carry within ourselves. We've come to Scotland not just because this is the first place in Britain that Romani people landed over 500 years ago, but because its history of traveling people goes back far further than that, well over a thousand years. When I come here and when I hear the Scottish travelers telling their stories, like the Stuarts did in the original ballad, I feel this deep connection to the oral tradition of our ancient past. And the reason I want to talk to Jess is to get a feel for where that magic comes from and how she's continuing that tradition today. Jess Smith is a Scottish gypsy traveller and a best-selling author. I've come to Argyllshire to ask Jess what she thinks needs to be said in a 21st century ballad of the travellers. I like to take a flower in my hand and, and go right through the bud and through the sap and, and get to the real story. I like to look at a cup and think, you come from sand, you know, and to, to become a beautiful china cup. I didn't write in my head, I wrote in my heart. My head wasn't educated enough. I wasn't writing about the pain and the sorrow. I wanted to share the laughter. I wanted to make people happy. When you think about us traveling folk, be happy. People think, when, when you use the word tinker, it's a derogatory term, but at one time it was not. It was a very important trade. That's where the word tinker comes from. To me, symbolically, the tinker's heart is, is a little stamp on the earth. 
Was it a standing stone? Was it an old Celtic church? I don't know. I have no idea. But it has a symbolic significance to the travelling people because that's where they went to get married. That's they took their babies to get christened and that's where they took their dead to get blessed before they buried them in the surrounding countryside. It's a heart because it has a beat. Spiritually, there's a beat there and it's calling out to us. We had our own beliefs, we had our own customs, you know, and we didn't need gods and, and anything like that. We had the strength of the earth. You take a culture from a person, you rip the heart for that person. And what have they got left? You know, what have they got left to pass on, to live for? The traveller would have a story to tell, a history. We never passed it down in books. We passed it down on the tongue. The travellers are very, very adaptable. You've got to make a living. And the most important thing is making a living within the boundaries of freedom, because that's what a traveller lives by. They say we leave litter and mess up the land. We're the dirty traveller. As an artist, Delaine Labar, my mum, still uses the old skills of making a living out of nothing. Are these falling to the wayside, or is the gypsy mentality finding different ways to express itself? For centuries, people have had to make a living or be able to survive with nothing. There was always people making pegs or baskets. And that was stuff they just found. So they'd only need like maybe a little hammer and a few little tacks or something if they were making the baskets and things. And the same with the, the pegs, because they'd just get a, you know, some old tin and cut that up. So it was quite a basic way of earning some money, but also most of your materials were for nothing. I try and look at what I do in terms of art as the same way. It's a bit like I take the, a lot of stuff that people disregard, and then I make it into something else. So it's a bit like magic and it's a bit like alchemy, but it's based in that way of being able to do that. If someone gives me a cardboard box of stuff, I can make it into something. I think often that's what's been the problem with people that aren't part of the community. And I think that's why people crave to be part of the community or have craved to be like bohemian or gypsy. Or I do come from a real place with these real people in it who are the way that I've described them. They're not some sort of mythology that I've made up. Taking what people disregard, a kind of alchemy. We are real people from a real place. Why do we still need to remind people of this today? Richard O'Neill is a traveller and a storyteller. Keeping up the magic has been his life's work. I think stories for us are more important because we don't have the same written history that other people have. We only have our stories. You can always find somebody in your family or extended family who will talk to you and tell you a story about one of your relatives. And, and I think that's fascinating because, you know, even, even today, you know, my dad was born in 1925 and passed away a long time ago. I go to places now and meet some older people who knew him and they'll tell me a story I didn't know about my dad. And that's fantastic. I don't think you necessarily have to be moving all the time to be a traveller. It's what we used to have to do for work. Up in the northeast now, there are kittiwakes, which is a seabird, which nest underneath the bridges in, in the city centre of Newcastle. Now, by rights, they're a seabird, but they worked out that actually nesting in the city centre is nice, and there's, a, there's plenty of food. They're still a kittiwake. They haven't changed as a bird, they've just changed their environment. They're not quite clever, really. One of the things I've, I've always say to young people or anybody, whatever culture you're from, you just have to outlast. And I think that's what our stories show, is that our stories outlast the tragedy. Our stories outlast the problems. You know, we as a people will outlast. You know, we just keep going. Next, I'd like to talk to Lisa Smith, to find out about the fresh challenges travellers face and the strengths they've developed to tackle them. Education comes in many shapes and forms, and I think people get confused with education and schooling. 
it's a legal obligation in this country for every child to receive an education, but it's not a legal obligation for every child to receive schooling. The current education system favours academic achievement much more highly than practical skills, which travellers have always historically and still now favour more highly often than academic and intellectual achievement, because we think in very practical means. With the increase of more people accessing education, achieving degrees, doctorates, PhDs, what we're going to increasingly see is gypsies and travellers in positions of power. So what I'd like to see uh, are more gypsies and travellers as politicians. I'd like to see more involved in policy making. There is definitely within this generation an increase in, in people having those ambitions. I don't think you have to choose between your culture and being educated. I think my education complements my culture. It's allowed me to learn more about who I am through researching language, through researching the rich, vibrant history that I have. But what it's also enabled me to do as well is to take that knowledge and to give it back to my people. Samson Rattigan is one of those people. He's been educated and now he feels that sense of responsibility to give something back. We're going to talk to Samson Rattigan, who's a young travelling man with a degree in film production. And what I want to talk to Samson about is how his perspective on the situation of travellers has been changed since he's been working on the front line of traveller activism. Most of the gypsy travellers I work with have all gone to primary school. Um, it seems to be secondary school where I almost drop out and there's not the retention there in the schools. I find it could be that the parents had a bad uh, experience in school, so a lot of bullying. There's nothing really about gypsies and travellers in, of their heritage in the um, school curriculum either. It's still quite rare that a young gypsy or traveller or Roma goes to further education and goes to un university and higher education. I've had some friends from the wider community that have, that have said stuff about travellers, and I'm, I'm saying, look, you know I'm a traveller, you've known me all my life, and they're like, yeah, but you're, you're different. I was like, no, no, I'm not. And then I've educated them, and they've, they've realised, and they've never got taught anything about it, and they get taught from stuff they read on, on social media and from the papers and stuff. Samson almost makes me feel like not that much has changed. There's still prejudice out there. How do gypsy people cope with this? How do they live their lives? A lot of the time you'll hear travellers say that nothing's changed. That's true in some ways, but it's also a bit of a rhetorical flourish. It's an expression of a feeling that, but obviously it has. And if you look at the people that we've spoken to, you can see why that is. But I think that when you're in our community, it's sometimes hard to see the wood for the trees. Well, I haven't spoken to the musicians yet, and without the musicians, it's not going to be much of a ballad. <laughs> so uh, I'm hoping that that goes well. I know the people that we're hoping to work with and they're absolutely brilliant at what they do, not just technically, but they know how to transmit our heart and soul through music. I'm at the stage where I can say, look, we've got these absolute nuggets of platinum, gold and diamonds from these generous people that we've spoken to and we're going to forge those into something quite special, I, I think and I hope. Charles Parker had an ear for the truths that society too often overlooked. We're going to talk to his daughter, Sarah, a BBC producer herself, to find out what Charles's approach was. How was he able to capture these gems of truth? I didn't need to go to dramatists, nor to go to actors, to get material to be a direct ingredient in a dramatic radio performance. I could go straight to the people. It's the real voice, I think, of England. I think it's that perfect storm, really, between him, John McCall and Peggy Seeger. I don't think I really appreciated how you could take sounds and voices 
and sort of build a picture really, which is of people's lives. Well, he always said that you sat at the feet of people and I think that's absolutely true. You sort of capture that moment of sound and set it like a jewel, you know. He was able, wasn't he, to get inside people's heads and their lives, really. And I think the music frames that even more, you know. And that's why the radio ballads are special. What is it that woman says? Till doomsday in the afternoon. That's such a piece of poetry, really. These folk will exist till the end of time and they'll never, ever change their ways and you'll never get rid of tinkers. They'll be there to doomsday in the afternoon. Peggy Seeger came to Britain as a young woman and soon embarked on a series of collaborations with Ewan McColl and Charles Parker. I want to ask Peggy what it was like capturing the voices of gypsies and travellers in the 1960s and what made the radio ballad so special. Ewan and I understood the way the folk tradition works. They spoke from an oral tradition. We sang from an oral tradition. And we could sense the kind of thing when they spoke that would become music. That's what the traditional ballads are. They are cut down to bone. And the listener puts the flesh and the skin on. We turned up at dusk for the family of Maggie Cameron. They were trees, they throw a big tarpaulin over, and then they peg it down all the way around. But to get into this bow tent, and it was a big one, probably about 20 feet across, you had to stoop, and they opened up the flap for you, and you stepped into the Middle Ages. And so here you have old people, young people, at varying states of illumination all around. And you have Maggie Cameron there, and her face is being lit by the fire. The way she spoke was biblical. And as sure as God's in the kingdom of heaven, she says, I nearly jumped out of the bed. My heart went quicker, she says, an attraction engine. We were there for about three, four, five hours while she just talked, and nobody else talked. It was as if she was talking for them all and they trusted her to tell it right. So they had a way of expressing it that we would never know ourselves. Mandy went to poo the grise all around the stuggers to kai the gavers off to Mandy to lay on me a prey. Ma said the rackly picking up the covers. Caroline Hughes actually, she was called Queen Caroline. She was the queen of her tribe. She referred to the big ballads as our religions. She tried to sing some 20s um, pop songs to us, and she looked at her and said, You didn't like that one, did you? And so Ewan said, no, we're looking for songs like um, Barbara Allen. Do you know Barbara Allen? And she, oh, Barbara Allen, that's one of our religions. Them's our history. Without them, we're nothing. That's what she said. And that's a direct quote, because I remember it totally. Without them, we're nothing. Without them, we're nothing. These songs were the most important things that gypsies and travelers had. Charles Parker had his collaboration with McColl and Seeger, so we need our own musical mind to tie it all together. At the time of the original travelling people, Irish travellers had recently been arriving in England in larger numbers. I'm meeting Thomas McCarthy in London, site of traveller campsites ancient and modern, to ask him about his background and his career bringing traveller stories to life in music. They're moving a sun again, post from pillar to post again. The old traditions will they come to an end, the roads they once were our home. My grandfather could listen to a song once and get it off to a tea. Well, they were the entertainment of the day up until the 1970s, some places even the 1980s. My grandfather was the first man in the town to get a radio. When they brought the radio into the house, half the town turned up. When they turned it on, my old grandfather started looking around him and the place went dead silent. And he said to them, take that machine over here. He said, that's a conversation killer. 
English travellers and Irish travellers were highly skilled in the art of conversation. We had to be. It was ten times harder for us to earn a living than it is for settled people. So we had to be good with our mouths. Poor gypsies persecuted again. The Irish pipes were designed to copy that style of singing. Over here they call it vibrato, but we, we wouldn't know about that name. We just say a warble in the voice. There's nobody left that does it. I am the last to do it, which is a shame. When travellers would mingle, they might go into a pub. If they started to sing the old ballads, the, the settled people would laugh at them. The settled people were singing Elvis and, and the Beatles. But luckily enough for us, we're behind the settled people. But I think that was to our benefit. We held on to the songs a lot more. Several of the songs from the travelling people have been absorbed into the traveller community and people sing them as their own, not always aware where they came from. Irish travellers argue with me and tell me that it's a traveller. It was written by a, tra it's a traveller, you know. And when they tell them, no, it's not, it's like persuading you black is white. You know, we'd make a, a cracking song. You shake my hand on that. We will do. I guarantee you we will. <laughs> Cheers, Thomas. So we've spoken to Thomas now, and basically I feel a lot better. <laughs> um, I didn't really believe we could do this. I, I thought we could do something, but I didn't know whether we'd be able to create a ballad which deserved to stand in the company of the original material. But now that he believes that, I believe that. We're at a recording studio in Hereford. I've spent the past two months polishing the thoughts of the people we met into some lyrics. We've got Thomas here. And amazingly, we've got the granddaughter of Charles Parker, Charlie Blue, who's gonna add some vocals for us and play the violin on the ballad. So, oh, the pressure's on. In the original Travelling People radio ballad, as these amazing little phrases, tiny little phrases that build up the picture. And I was looking for the equivalent of these things that Charles Parker, Ewan McCall and Peggy Seeger managed to get back in the 60s when they were talking to travelling people. Just these little gems, phrases that, that spoke volumes about who they were. I don't feel nervous at all. I'm quite looking forward to it. I think it's going to be really good. So here we are at the end of our search for the ballad of the travelling people today. It's been an amazing journey for me and for everyone involved. And I just hope we've been able to honour that incredible legacy. So here it is, the new ballad of the travelling people, the famous Flashing Lane. Twas a mellow morn of summer when green was on the land. I drove alone for Appleby in ancient Westmoreland. Until my sight with trailers bright was filled and I lowly came to where the famous horses run, the famous flashing lane. The old did shout as the young rode out, as brave as any I saw. Yet among the glad I felt me sad, for a day did come no more. Till I caught the eye on a stallion high of a maid, and she spoke my name. And a silence strange brang a ghostly change. Along the flashing lane And as she stared I remembered And I said Such is my grief That my ancient race Should be disgraced As none but tramps and thieves For I recall When we had fear all Our stories and our good name 
and the right to stay by the ancient way of the famous flashing in. Now on the television screen, a laugh at us for fools, for potent strength and shelter forced, and failing in their schools. No word get we of apology for their crimes, and it stays the same. Now why should we vote when there's no hope for the famous flashing limb? She smiled at me and said, now see, I bring a secret word from those who sleep beneath your feet within the ancient earth. What is success in your busyness if all is stress and strain? And who knows best by those who rest beside the flashing lane? For take the sunlight from the world and go your own shines. Take every chance you get in life, but also take your time. If you only see the rain And it's always summer somewhere Flashing down the flashing lane There won't be strength or cleverness That helps us in the world But another strong young mother Bring up a little girl Oh, don't despair as you stand there The future's not and as long as there are travelers, there will be a flashing lane. She said these words and disappeared from clean out of my sight. And faces filled the lane again with laughter in the light. She might have been my imagining, and I saw her near again. But I won't forget the one I met on the famous flashing lane.